the same time, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu insists there will be no ceasefire in Gaza until Hamas releases its 240 hostages. This as the death toll continues to ride, rise rather, amid Israel's relentless bombardment of Gaza. The war was triggered by Hamas's unprecedented attack one month ago. Over 10,000 people have been killed in Gaza as the war passes that one month mark. Israel's top ally, the United States, has backed Israel's war on Hamas, but also urged restraint and a humanitarian ceasefire to allow aid into Palestine. And I'm joined now by international relations analyst Brooks Spector. Brooks, thanks so much for joining us. Um, there was wide expectation uh, that the international relations minister might call or might say that she wants to expel the Israeli ambassador. She didn't make any suggestions uh, around that in her speech today. Do you think that she's decided not to take that route or could it still be on the cards diplomatically? Well, good evening. Good to be with you. I, I mean, let's review the territory uh, in terms of diplomatic relations. Uh, the, in initial circumstances, uh, a country that is dissatisfied with another country's position or actions or behavior or statements uh, can issue a demarche that is a formal uh, objection. Uh, you could call in an ambassador for a stern talking to, quote unquote, uh, or you could, in ultimate terms, uh, remove your own ambassador and then uh, encourage the other country to remove theirs, or even uh, issue a persona non grata, that is, a, a person who is not welcomed uh, in notice, usually that gives them, you know, that don't let the door hit you on the way out kind of uh, response. Um, the problem with doing anything beyond a demarche or even a, a call in for, you know, a, a, something of a hectoring lecture is that you begin very quickly to eliminate any possibility that you will have any further leverage in circumstances that you'll be unable to offer your assistance as a mediator or go-between and that it is, becomes quite clear where you stand and what it is you expect to happen without any indication that you are prepared to be engaged with, not necessarily sympathetic to, but certainly engaged with both sides of an argument. And it needs to be uh, pointed out that the current issue, the war in Gaza, is not something in which South Africa itself is directly involved in. They're not, there are no South African troops, obviously. There are no South African material interests or tangible assets that are, that are there. So it's, it, it's something of, and I hesitate to say this, but I'm going to, I'm going to say that, that these decisions as, as they're being made take on a kind of performative quality to them rather than getting to the specifics and, and the, the hard grinding of diplomacy. Removing your own ambassador from, and staff apparently from Tel Aviv, uh, has an unfortunate aspect to it, aside from the demonstration of your displeasure. Let's say for the, for the sake of argument, assuming there is a group of Christian pilgrims going to the Holy Land uh, to visit various religious sites, if they happen to encounter an accident or if something un unfortunate happens to them, there will be no embassy staff for which they can turn to for assistance. And that obviously is not something to be uh, hoped for. Mm. Yeah, and that's, that's certainly the, the first move which we saw yesterday. Do you believe there's more to come uh, from our international relations minister? I don't know. Um, I mean, to some degree, uh, Naledi Pandor is responding to some sectors of the population, a significant number of people, obviously, who feel that some serious stern measures need to be taken. Uh, but again, as I said, the, the, the more you do, the less likely it is you have any say in the way things evolve beyond that. Hmm. Um, is our government's firm support for Palestine, um, and some would say Hamas, given it's well known uh, that Naledi Pandor had a conversation with the leader of Hamas, is that at risk of damaging our relations with other countries? 
Well, it certainly puts other countries on notice uh, that South Africa is taking a side, uh, is taking a side not just in, in, in verbal terms, but taking a side in actual efforts, actual activities. I mean, the conversation with, with the Hamas leader uh, has now obviously been open to some interpretation as to what actually was offered or explained. But even so, it, 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 it's, it's hard for me to visualize in many other countries taking upon themselves the idea that they will, or their leaders will, speak directly with Hamas in the middle of this to offer sympathy, to offer assistance, to offer stern and uh, strong words about the situation in Gaza is one thing, to embrace in some way, shape, or form the initial instigators of the current dire circumstances, I think is a little different. Hmm. Uh, you know, last week we hosted the African Growth and Opportunities Act Forum, which is that preferential trade deal, which is hugely beneficial not just to South Africa but to many other countries in the region. Um, what we're hearing today is that um, in the U.S. Democratic Senator Chris Coons is proposing a bill that will extend AGOA by 16 years, but at the very same time also review South Africa's eligibility. And apparently it seems to be for two reasons. One, uh, a sense that uh, South Africa may have almost graduated out of a go. We've got as much benefit as we should, um, and maybe it's time for us to stand on our own two feet. I think that's one of the sort of the premises of it. But the other is the ongoing concern about the stance we've taken around Russia. We have not condemned Russia for invading Ukraine. Um, and now our position on Palestine. You know, of course, South Africa is a sovereign state. It can, it can make the decisions it wants to. But do you think uh, that the policy positions we've taken around Russia, around Palestine, could they really materially harm the AGOA deal, for example? Well, let's, let's be very careful on AGOA uh, in explanation. It's not actually a deal. It's not a trade negotiation. It's not, a, uh, it's not an agreement between nations. It's unilateral law passed by the United States Congress, uh, which means that the Congress obviously has the right privilege to extend it, to eliminate it, or to change it in some material way. Uh, it is, to me, quite concerning that Senator Chris Coons, uh, who has long been a supporter of AGOA, who has long been a supporter and a, something of a cheerleader, in fact, for America's relationship with South Africa, for him to, to publicly take that stance is a kind of a shot across the bow, if you will, uh, to the South African authorities that please understand that your access to the American market under preferential uh, trade circumstances is not a given. It's not a God-given right. It's something that the U.S. Congress will get to chew on and decide uh, in the next year and a uh, year and a half, I guess. Because the, the law itself expires in the year 2025, uh, and given all the turmoil in Congress, it's not going to be the first or the second or even the third thing that Congress is going to take up. Uh, but the texture of the way South Africa is carrying out its international relations has obviously caught the attention of both senators and members of the House of Representatives. I think in the House of Representatives, there is more of a feeling that South Africa has uh, blotted its copybook in a way than even in the Senate. And so this is going to require, I don't want to use the phrase damage control, but it's going to certainly require some effort by, by South African government officials to speak to the urgent need for continuing uh, the legislation and for continuing South Africa's in engagement and involvement in it by pointing out, among other things, that some of the surrounding countries in Southern Africa benefit indirectly from South Africa's uh, participation under the AGOA principles, and that it has a significant impact on um, working class people in South Africa, because uh, depending on how you read the numbers, something on the order of 85,000 jobs are directly attributable to, to AGOA. And uh, I've seen figures, and I don't know, I can't verify this on, 
right now, but something in the order of 10% of the GDP of South Africa tends to be dependent on hmm. uh, exports under a GOA because they're mainly value-added products rather than, as uh, one of the ministers the other day said, exporting rocks. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for your insights. Really appreciate it. That was International Relations Analyst Brooks Spector.